There's just is that is that the Good evening. Hopefully, we're testing here and we're good on sound. Good. Thank you, Don Lynch, for being in the back and helping us this evening. Let's give Don a hand. We couldn't do this. Good evening and welcome to the 2018 Fall Candidate Forum by PAVE. Our group is called Pottawatomie County Advocates for Voter Education. And on behalf of PAVE, thank you for attending tonight's forum. If you would at this time, uh, if you are sitting, if you can, would you please rise and we'll have a flag salute. Attention, position, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's forum is being live-streamed on www.shawneeok.org backslash live and on cable channel 30. Also, those who have an iPad may, may access it by Ustream and searching for Shawnee. <clears throat> I want to thank the city of Shawnee for allowing us the use of the commission chambers tonight for tonight's broadcast. And special thanks to Steve Nolan and to Don Lynch, who uh, helped to make tonight possible for the broadcast. I hope when you arrive this evening that you had an opportunity to participate in our fishbowl poll. We're doing the five state questions. They are outside on the table uh, to your right as you exit the commission chambers. We'll take the results and count those tonight before the end of the forum so we might have the results. You'll also notice on the table that we have the League of Women Voters uh, Voters Guide for 2018 copies there. Uh, those are free. Please take those. And if you have organizations or groups that you'd like to share, you're welcome to take some of them as well. Uh, there are candidates this evening. Or let me introduce first our pay um, members and volunteers who are here. Ronnie Sharp will be helping this evening also as a moderator. Ronnie. <laughs> Susan Morris and Laurie Snyder are doing our screening. They check for duplications and relevance on our questions. And Sally McLaughlin will be doing our timing. And Gloria also helps by handing out our, our uh, cards and also does all of the contacting of our candidates and really doing all of our press releases and setting up uh, the guidelines for the forum itself. <laughs> Glory is worried because uh, I think we had stated one minute uh, on the responses and we're actually tonight going to do a two-minute opening, a two-minute response on questions, and then a one-minute closing. 
Oh, uh, typically we do not allow any kind of candidate uh, wear or uh, materials inside the commission when we're in the process of doing our forms. But uh, I think we failed to, to provide that information to our candidates. Uh, we want to go ahead and get started. We flipped a coin tonight for our House District 26 to begin with. And uh, Dr. Terry Hopkins won uh, the, the coin flip. And uh, I'd like for Dr. Hopkin, Hopkins to come up. He is the Democrat running for House District 26. And our incumbent, Republican Dale Curbs, if Dale would come up. Please join me in welcoming these two. Thank you. directed to them individually, but also if they do have, we'll also direct that to the other candidate as well. Uh, tonight, uh, we really want to hear from candidates, and uh, so we've kind of expanded a little bit on the time to allow that to happen. So, uh, shall we begin? Dr. Hopkins, you won the coin flip. You may begin with a two-minute opening. Well, thanks first to... Uh, members of TAVE for having this forum. It certainly is, uh, gives us an opportunity to reach a lot of people uh, in a short period of time. Um, I think uh, we did this once before earlier and it worked out real well. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of uh, Pot County, uh, most of it right here in District 26. Uh, with the exception of uh, a couple of years World War II and uh, a couple of years in early practice after I finished dental school. Uh, we've lived here, Margaret and I met at OBU, uh, raised our families, raised our family here. All of our uh, kids, with the exception of Matt, Matt finally moved out and uh, he's living in Edmond now, but so everybody's close. Um, grandkids live here, great grandkids, so we are invested in Pot County in, in District uh, 26. A friend of mine a long time ago whose, whose family set the standard for service in the state of Oklahoma, uh, Judge Lloyd Henry, said service is the rent we pay for the space we occupy. Well, I have occupied space in Oklahoma I'm ready now to pay my rent. I want to do this, I want to serve, so I'm here to answer your questions. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins. Representative Curbs. Well, I'll echo uh, Dr. Hopkins. We've, we've been here before and uh, we we're definitely very appreciative of PAVE uh, for holding the second and final forum on there, so we definitely appreciate that. Uh, I've been in the community now uh, since 90, since mid 90s. Uh, have two children that go to public school here, both uh, one in high school, one in uh, junior high, I guess it would be, uh, girls. I own a business. Uh, I, my philosophy is, is if they fill a need, see a need, fill a need. I think that's one of those uh, comedies that they have in the movies uh, on that. But I mean, it really is when we see a problem as as folks in in the state and around we just need to get in there and get it done um, so that's a lot of the reason i uh, decided to run two years ago uh, we talked about it i was asked i uh, was looking at the city council to get more involved i sat on the planning commission during that time and i was asked to uh, go to the state level uh, i said okay let's let's do this uh, I'm a fighter for all of us. I want to make sure our voice is heard and continue to be heard. Uh, we had a challenging last session. We've come out on top of that. Uh, we are looking good at the state, and I want to continue that progress and make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing in this state, and that's taking care of Oklahomans. 
each other one-on-one -on -one, all across. And that means representing my district. With my district, uh, that is my first priority, is the House District uh, 26, making sure that our, our concerns are met and we take those headstrong and then looking at it through an Oklahoma uh, eye as well. So uh, I'm excited to be here again this evening and to have this forum, and uh, I'm ready to get with questions. Okay, let's begin. Dr. Hopkins, you're first. Halls Valley, Sayre, and several other rural hospitals have closed or will close in coming months. Why are rural hospitals closing and what can be done to stop this? Well, unfortunately, uh, a few years back, uh, our governor refused to take uh, federal funds from uh, the uh, Health Care Act that would have infused millions of dollars into the healthcare system in Oklahoma. And it was refused because they said we couldn't afford it. Uh, we would have to pay $1 for every $9 in money that came from the federal government. And you've got to understand, those $9 are our $9. We paid those in taxes. They are to come back to us and because we refused them, they were sent someplace else. Other folks got to use our money. Um, it was said that we couldn't afford the 10% uh, that we would have to put up, be too expensive. I was talking to uh, somebody in the budget office at the state uh, yesterday, and we are gonna wind up paying back to the federal government more money than it would have cost us initially to take this uh, increase uh, in federal funds, uh, and we're going to lose some uh, research education product, uh, projects uh, along with it. So yes, we're losing, uh, Pulse Valley's a nice sized town. They don't have a hospital. They've got to come to uh, Purcell. It's just, it's really, really, really dire situation. So we're going to have to make some improvements there. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yeah. Paul's Valley, Sayre, and several other rural hospitals have closed or will close in coming months. Why are rural hospitals closing, and what can be done to stop this? Well, uh, as it was stated, our, our governor did. Uh, declined the uh, hundred million dollar price tag, which in turn was a nine billion dollar, I mean a nine hundred million dollar back to the state. The problem is right now that we're facing is how would we, how would we be able to fund nine hundred million dollars? We talk about that being our tax dollars going to the federal side. Let me explain that. When it goes up there, yes, it, we do get some of that back. The federal government, as we are speaking right now, is talking about doing away with that. And that is a subsidy, more or less, in that aspect to send to these hospitals that helps those hospitals and helps those places out. But if we continue to do handouts and not hand ups, then what we would end up with is a, is a potential billion dollar bill that we as Oklahomans cannot afford. So we have to look at all aspects of those and start looking into that uh, financial. What looks like that it may be a good idea in, in, in taking funding is not necessarily a good idea for the longevity and the whole of our state. So we have to look at those things going into, into those uh, options that are available for us. Representative Curves, this question is for you. Some of Oklahoma's veterans' homes have been shown to provide lax or poor care. As a legislator, legislator, how will you improve care for veterans? Well, thank you. Um, we have already started in on the auditing and process working with the VA because we understand the veterans' system is, is a flawed system. Uh, when I was 
up there for these last two years. We were already talking that discussion. We have a situation right now with the hospital over in Talamina that's dealing with, or Talahina, sorry, that's dealing with uh, those exact situations. Their problem uh, in that particular situation is they cannot get qualified staff to drive out into the middle of nowhere. So hard decisions have to be made. Moving these hospitals to more towns the size of Shawnee or even larger to get the qualified staff that we need in these rural facilities, including the VA and the rural hospitals, getting these into the facilities so that we can get the quality care that everybody deserves. Thank you, Representative Curbs. Dr. Hopkins, would you like to respond to this question? Well, I, uh, I'm operating at a disadvantage here because I don't have some of the information that Representative Curbs has in knowing the percentage of funding of these facilities, uh, state funds and federal funds. Um, I know the, the federal government is struggling to adequately fund the VA hospitals uh, to bring them up to par. It's not just in Oklahoma, it's, a, it's nationwide uh, that we're substandard in dealing with our uh, veterans and their health care. The long waiting lines for folks to get in for basic care. Um, so this is something I'd have to look into, get educated, and uh, see what we can do in the state to get the federal government to do what they they should do, and then we'll take our part. Dr. Hopkins, do you support the state contracting with private prisons? Why or why not? No, I don't. And I know that's uh, probably a, a very simple answer to a complex question. We, would, we got started down this road some time ago. Um, Any time you contract state needs with private industry, private industry is in there to make, to make a profit. And so we're paying more for their services uh, than, we, than we could if we did it ourselves. But I, I think at this point, we've let our state facilities uh, uh, deteriorate to the point that it'd be difficult for us to assume all of that responsibility. One of my things in running for House District 26 is to see if we can't make uh, more sensible sentencing of uh, lawbreakers, not put everybody in prison that, that doesn't need to be there. Uh, the the uh, marijuana uh, passage is going to alleviate that some because it's gone from a it's gone to a misdemeanor from a felony, and uh, the sentencing is going to be uh, different than it has been in the past. But not all uh, infractions need to put people in prison, so we've got to take a look at that. But if we could get away from the, the private prisons, I would sure like it. Representative Curb, did you like me to repeat the question? Do you support the state contracting with private prisons? Why or why not? It's definitely a complex issue um, on that. The, our DOC system right now is, is at a breaking point. Uh, we have a criminal justice reform uh, package that's been going through. We passed seven bills this last session. They all passed through on criminal justice reform. The, the problem is is if we grow state to take care of everything then we're the one the state then sets the bar on the price not efficiency of price they set that bar on that price whatever that bar may be because they're the single provider we've got to get out of that mindset and make sure that we keep it in a competitive market 
And if that means uh, private prisons, if they come in at a competitive market and they can do it more efficient than the state, then yes, I'm for that. If they can't on certain situations, I understand that well. I understand that as well. So what is in the best interest of the state of Oklahoma and the citizens with the due dollars and the due diligence spending those dollars wisely that we have and not just putting it to a single provider component. So uh, that's where you know we get into and we think, oh, well, the state can do things better. The state can, but if nobody's doing checks and balances at the state in some of those things, well, then what normally would take any private practice to do with five folks would take the state 10. So that's the thing we've got to keep in mind. So as far as to answer that question, yes in those situations and no in those situations. It's kind of complicated, but, you know, it's exactly how it is. It's what is the best market. Representative Curbs, how do you intend to increase education funding? Do you support restructuring funding criteria for schools to help schools who serve underprivileged children to improve education for those who need it the most and are currently receiving the least? Well, we'll start the first part of that question, uh, talking about the funding for education. Uh, we made large strides in making sure that we did an, a positive investment into our education system, our public education system. And we need to make sure that we stay on track with that. We are absolutely not done. Uh, you know, the foundation for our workforce and everything else is education. So in order to stay on track, we've got to look both at efficiencies and at the same time. We've got additional revenue dollars that are going to start coming in on the medical marijuana. And, you know, we've got, so there's some money that could be utilized there. The thing we've got to start looking at is how are we going to make sure we're properly funding classrooms. That is one thing that we have not been able to do. We've been under budget constraints. But at the same time, we need to make sure we're good stewards of the $2.9 billion budget that education has. And moving forward, you know, we're not going to get less kids in the system. We're now close to 700,000 pupils in the state of Oklahoma. So we need to make sure that we are doing our due diligence because we cannot ask our teachers to do a job if we don't equip them to do the job that we ask them to do. Now just think about that. If you go to do a job and they're asking you to type something up on a computer and they don't give you a computer, how do you do the job? That's what I'm talking about. So we got to make sure that we are not only having the best qualified folks in the classroom, getting away from these emergency certified folks and getting certified teachers back in there, we also have to make sure that we, they have the tools that needs to be done to do that. And we're on a right track to do that, and we've got to stay on that right track to do that. Dr. Hopkins, would you like me to repeat the question? How do you intend to increase education funding? Do you support restructuring funding criteria for schools to help schools who serve underprivileged children to improve education for those who need it the most and are currently receiving the least? The uh, legislature this last spring finally took a step in the right direction uh, in approving teachers' pay raises. Didn't go far enough, but we're working with limited funds, and I realize that. Uh, there are some, uh, in fact, there's a, a state question uh, on the ballot this year dealing with what's called a vision fund, uh, and we'll probably get to that later. Uh, the cigarette tax and the gas tax uh, both will raise a considerable amount of money. I have a little problem with the cigarette tax uh, in that we're trying to get people to quit smoking, but we want to tie our teachers' raises to uh, something that we're wanting to, to phase out. Um, you're dealing with, with special needs children. You're getting into the area of teachers who are qualified to do those to meet those special needs. Uh, we have to have 
teachers trained and uh, mostly in the state I've got a granddaughter that's going that's going into education and uh, my hope is that by the time she graduates we can keep her here I'd hate for her to have to leave um, but the special needs kids are going to have to have special attention you can't put 30 kids in a room teacher and expect them to meet all their needs. Our next question, and this will go to Dr. Hopkins. Oklahoma continues to perform in the top 10 states for the worst outcomes in child abuse, domestic abuse, divorce, overall health, uninsured citizens, poverty, and other social problems. How do you feel about those statistics, and are you willing to do what's necessary to reverse these trends? Well, I think those statistics stink. Uh, I, I, am, I am proud to be in Oklahoma. Uh, I, like I say, I've lived here all my life. We haven't always been a leader in the worst categories. Uh, we've had uh, excellent education systems. We've had healthy folks. We've had uh, families that stay together. But this is not a a single. Uh, it's not a simple answer to a, to a single problem. It's going to take time. Education is the big uh, mover in this area. Folks are going to have to be educated to learn how to eat properly, to learn how exercise properly to keep their to keep their bodies healthy to learn how to sleep properly quit smoking uh, we have we probably have more smokers per capita in Oklahoma than any place else even with fried foods uh, and it's just uh, it's not a healthy situation so education is going to be the big uh, mover in this area Thank you. Representative Kerr, can I repeat the question? I think I know. I know. Thank you. The, um, we talk about those top 10, 10 uh, nomers on there. Uh, they are, sh we should be ashamed of those. Uh, we also need to remember that, unfortunately, we've been in a uh, declining economy for several years. So uh, state-funded agencies have been starved to death on certain aspects of their money. And they, uh, as far as being the agencies cutting, those are done at the agency head. We try now to, as a legislative body, are getting control of those. But you need to understand how the uh, how state, which I did two years ago, you would think that you voted for somebody to be your representative and your senator, that they go up there and they make heads roll and these agency heads do exactly what needs to be done. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. We have independent committees that are appointed committees that control these agencies. So when I go in, one of the first things that happened was an agency had didn't agree with what I did, and I said, well, we're going to be changing that. They look right at you and say, I'll outlast you. You're, you're term limited on 12 years. I'll be here forever, and you can't touch me. You can't hire me. You can't fire me. Well, the one thing we can do is mess with their budgets. And when I say mess with their budgets, when somebody messes with your checkbook or a $20 bill that's in your wallet, it makes you stand up and pay attention. And that's what we have to do in order to get these agencies. You take the health department, for instance. We understand the importance of the health department. We went through that process you know, with them. We, they came, came to the legislature and said, we needed $100 million. We said, that's not going to happen. That's the stewards people. You've done ill will with the money. They, we settled that down to $30 million to try to stabilize the health mark. Lo and behold, after we sent an auditing group in there, we find $30 million hidden in a slush fund. Where is that acceptable? That's not acceptable for any single person in this room. So keep those things in mind when you're talking about that. And, and my time's up real quick. But some of the things need to be changed in just the wording. Let's talk about the child abuse, and I'll go real quick. Child abuse law changed one word from uh, promptly to immediately made the difference in a world this last year. Thank you, Representative Curves. 
and you have the next question. <clears throat> if you're reelected and Drew Edmondson is governor, would you work with him to change Oklahoma for the better? Unlike the Republicans in Congress in Oklahoma have been unwilling to work with Democrats. Well, that seems a little uh, party side there, but uh, which I don't think is accurate. Um, let's 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 uh, step back on the second part of that question. We'll get to the first part. The uh, when we talk about Republicans not willing to work with the Democrats. Uh, we did a 76, uh, 76 vote this last so session on an education uh, increase for an investment into education. There's not 76 Republicans up there. So I get a little uneasy or edged, I should say, when somebody says, well, it's all party politics. It's not. It's not even possible to make these hard, these hard decisions that were made without coming together. Now, granted, we do have folks that are on the far left and the far right that can't see eye to eye. Doesn't matter if they're trying to get at the same dollar or trying to cross the street or the bridge and the only bridge crossing that river. They won't walk across it. I can't help that. What I can do is make sure that we do everything we can to work. If you're 50% happy and I'm 50% happy, we have compromised and moved this state forward. And that is what happened. It doesn't matter what, once the people have made their selection of who they want their representation to be, from the governor to the lieutenant governor and all the way down, then it becomes the decision, or it becomes the responsibility of that person to work through and make those compromises and get the job done. And it's been proven over this last session and it's gonna, going to be continued to be proven. Some of my best colleagues that I work with on bills up there are Democrats. You know what? I don't look at them as a Democrat. I look at them like, as a colleague that I work with on legislation. Thank you. Dr. Hopkins, would you want me to repeat the question? No, I got it. <laughs> well, I think I can work with Drew Edmondson real easily. <laughs> Um, I applaud the legislature for the almost impossible vote that they got this last session to pass the funding for the teachers. 75% is just out of line. Uh, like I said in the forum before, when we passed that, it sounded like a good deal because we were trying to keep paying so many taxes, but it, it, it just is not workable. I think practically, um, not just in our state, but in our national politics, Democrats and Republicans have become very, very polarized. And there are instances, I think, when they reach across the aisle, and when they do, they can get things done. But that's that is the single most important thing that we have got to do is start talking to each other, working for the good of the district, working for the good of the state, and we can swing this around and it's not gonna it's not gonna come immediately. It will take a while. Uh, but I, Democrats and Republicans can talk curb my smile at each other the time we see each other. There you go. There you go. Okay, Dr. Hopkins, this question is for you. <clears throat> Many people who become involved in the criminal justice system find themselves saddled with excessive fees, fines, and costs that often pre present barriers uh, that delve them deeper into the system. The dynamic disproportionality offers or is altered or affects the poor, how would you stop the debtor prisons? Well, one of the things that's going to go a long ways is, is the uh, reworking our sentencing structure so that people who have no business being in prison are not there. 
Now that doesn't mean that they go scot-free and uh, they don't they aren't punished for what they do, but they just don't have to be in prison to do it. The fees and fines that are that are added on mostly affect the lower income people, and they get in a downward spiral that they just absolutely cannot get out of. Not a simple answer to this question. Uh, Chris Steele has worked diligently at this, and we're making strides at it. Uh, but it's going to take more than just a short-term, simple answer to get it corrected. Thank you. Person Kurt, may I repeat the question? I'm good. Okay. Uh, the criminal justice reform system, uh, as, as we're moving through from st state question 780 and 781, uh, like I said earlier, uh, we passed seven bills in the legislative body this last session. One of those was se Senate Bill 689. Had a, had a component in there that talks specifically about debtor prison, uh, those aspects. It does not help for us to continue to rack up fines and fines and fines. And, and expect them to become a member of society when we want to lock them up because they owe us a bill. But we've got to get out of that mindset, and you've heard me say it before, is we have got to get out of the mindset and lock people up we are afraid of, not that we are mad at. Because if we were locking people up we were mad at, half of this room would be locked up by the other side of this room. We all know it. And so we have got to get out of that and start looking at that. And we are moving in that direction with the state's coffers starting to fill up and we're, getting, we're seeing the, uh, the reinvestment into education, looking at reinvestment into our agencies. We're coming out of that recession. We've got to be due diligence with the dollars we have on hand. We are one of the top five states in fiscal management. And the reason is is because we don't hand out IOUs or run a deficit in this state. So as we continue to go through that, we have to deal with the money on hand and make sure we're doing the due diligence in that. And that goes all the way through from our education to our criminal justice reform to our health care and just on down that line. Thank you. Representative Curbs, this question is directed uh, specifically to you. Set the record straight. Did you say that teachers should pay for classroom supplies out of their new raises? Well, to the simple answer that be no. Um, there is a Facebook posting was also done on a with a uh, re a um, reverend out of uh, Bethel, and uh, when uh, when I've met with the hundreds of teachers that came up there, too many so much for my office that we actually got a conference room to meet with several of them at a time. What I said was what we have on hand uh, as far as the 1010XX was a bill to pass that gave the teachers a pay raise. And it had $20 million into classroom funding. Now, I've been in the school system. I worked in the school system. I have seen there is no doubt in my mind when teachers were in my office telling me the amount of money they spend in their classrooms. I can tell you because I've done it myself with my sister-in-law's classroom. So when I, when I made the statement of the only avenue we had was the pay raise, what I said is I understand you will not stop spending money on your classroom because teachers don't stop. They continue to make sure they are meeting the services and the needs of those kids in the classroom. So the only way that I could give them any kind of reward or aspect which long overdue was through their pay raise. What they do with their pay raise is obviously their option and their choice to do. Now it was it was uh, put out on Facebook, which everybody's really tough on Facebook till you meet them face to face. Uh, but the, that the uh, reverend that put the posting out there, I reached out to him, called him, just visited with him. And he actually went in his Facebook posting, and not only did he change the actual face, Facebook's posting after he visited with me, I did not ask him to do that. He also said I was an honorable man, and very well, he respected that conversation very well. 
So I have no problem uh, clarifying that and getting that out there. Thank you. Dr. Hopkins, how would you increase state revenue with fees, income taxes, fines? If yes, why? Or, or if not, why not? One thing that we can do uh, that will have an immediate effect, and, and the, again, the state legislature took a step in the right direction by raising the gross production tax uh, to what? Did you go to 4% or 5%? 4% on uh, gross production tax? 5%. Uh, but it needs to be back at 7%. We're, that seems to be the average for this part of the country. Folks are going to drill for oil. They're not going to quit drilling for oil in Oklahoma if our gross produ production tax it goes from 5% to 7%. had breakfast with uh, Jim Townsend and Clifton Scott a couple of three weeks ago, and we were talking about this very thing, and they both were uh, in the state government one way or the other when the gross production tax came in at 7%. And Jim said, we were floating in money. And they were. They had a lot of money. Um, that's, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to uh, eliminate the exemption on uh, capital gains. We pay capital gains tax at the federal level. It's at a reduced rate from ordinary income. Um, I, can, I can see paying a moderate tax on capital gains. Um, the tax on, on gasoline and cigarettes is a, is a regressive tax, and I wish we didn't have to do that. I really do. But it does bring in needed funds uh, for programs that we want to uh, provide. Thank you. Representative Curbs, how would you increase state revenue? With fees, income taxes, fines, if yes, why? And if not, why not? Well, I think we we did a pretty good job on uh, coming up with a compromise to make an investment into our education system. Uh, some misnomers that I want to get out, out there. GPT. GPT is not paid by the oil industry. It's paid by the landowner under royalty fees. So it's a tax. So keep that in mind when you we talk about GPT. That could be your neighbor sitting right there. You're wanting to hit them just because they found oil or natural gas underneath their property. So let's think about that. Next, we talk about capital gains. Capital gains, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little experiment and I'm going to need some audience participation with a show of hands and keep your hands up. How many of you have a retirement? How many of you own a home? How many of you have a business? All right, there's your capital gains. Everybody willing to give up another 5%? Okay. There we thought. Exactly. That's what capital gains is. So you need to think about those things before we do it. That is another tax on your hard end. If you, as a farmer, if you have a cow, she gets pregnant, guess what? You have a capital gains. You buy a house right or you buy a business building or commercial property because it was a good deal and next year it's worth more money, guess what? It's capital gains. Your 401k, your retirement plan, you cash it out, get ready to do it, guess what? Capital gains. So let's talk about what happened up there at the Capitol on capital gains. That was a question that wasn't vetted, wasn't anything. It went through committee and was trying to be brought straight to the floor. If we want legislation out there to be brought straight from the floor with not vetting numbers or anything else like that, then why do we even have a legislative body? That's the thing. We're out there to make sure that we're protecting every single person on some of the craziness that happened at the Capitol. If we want to have a real serious cap, uh, conversation on capital gains, I'm more than happy to do it, but we're not just pulling it out of a hat and making that decision. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Hopkins, criminal justice reform bills were passed by the 2018 legislature, slowing prison growth but only reducing the population by 5,000 inmates by 2026. 
Will you continue to support reform so Oklahoma is not number one in women and number four in men's incarceration? I sure will. Um, the reforms that are being undertaken are going to make a difference. They are not going to do away with the need for more beds in prisons in the immediate future because our state's growing and our criminal justice system finds people guilty that need to be incarcerated. But if we can slow this down by not putting people in prison who don't need to be in prison, then eventually, somewhere down the line, we can catch up with it. Can we stop building prisons? Right now, probably not. We're probably going to have to do it. Will they be private prisons? Probably. Do I like any of that? No, I don't. Representative Curb shall repeat the question. Criminal justice reform bills were passed by the 2018 legislature, slowing prison growth, but only reducing the population by 5,000 inmates by 2026. Will you continue to support reform so Oklahoma is not number one in women and number four in men's incarceration? Simple answer, yes. Absolutely. Uh, on those seven bills that I talked about, I was a yes on every single one of those. Uh, we have got to get in a mindset exactly like what we've talked about. The uh, infrastructure system that we have cannot handle the incarceration rate at which we are sending folks to prison. So with the criminal justice reform bills, the two that were passed, 780 and 781, 2016 were just passed. So we've, now we've got to catch up. The problem we have is our infrastructure. We haven't had the funding, they haven't had the funding to, been able, to be able to adequately do what those two state questions were intended to do. And so as we continue through this process, uh, you know, I, I would agree that we are obviously going to be putting, sending people to prison that duly need to be sent to prison. Do we need to be sending everybody to prison? No. We need to make sure that we let our law enforcement and those folks do the job that they are hired or elected to do and move forward in that direction. The, the uh, great part about the way our state is set up and the flaw is we have a legislative body that is made up of multiple parties and then we that is where the laws are written. It then gets passed down to the law enforcement and the DA's offices that then have to enforce those laws. And, it, on the, uh, and then from that point then it gets down to the judges and gets to the interpretation of the law. So we have a great system. We just need to make sure and hold that system accountable from all levels and make sure that we're funding it to, to get the results that we want and that we voted for on those two state questions. Thank you. This will be our last question before our closing uh, arguments here. Uh, and Representative Curbs, this is directed to you. Do you support judicial independence? keeping appointment and retention of judges nonpartisan. Yes. Dr. Hopkins, do you support judicial independence keeping appointment and retention of judges nonpartisan? Sure do. That concludes our questioning for this evening, but we'll now close with a one minute closing and I believe uh, Representative Kerbs, you're first. Again, I want to thank, uh, thank Pave for being here this evening and, and taking this on. Uh, you guys have done a great job. This would be my fourth one, so I really appreciate that. Uh, it's great to see so many folks. Uh, I hope you're out here for my, mine and Terry's race. Uh, I don't think so. But, uh, <laughs> but, but that being said, uh, all races are important, and we need to make sure that we're doing our due diligence and asking those questions. And I'll ask for your continued support. Uh, to send me back up to the state uh, house and uh, continue to do the job that you asked me to do two years ago. And I think my voting record proves that I listen to the folks of the district first and make sure that I keep our state in mind. So I ask for your support on November, tw on November 6th. Thank you, Representative Curbs. Dr. Hopkins. 
Well, I thank all of you for coming out. We've had, uh, this has been a good year for uh, interest in the, uh, in our voting system. Uh, we've had some big issues and we've had, and from those, we've picked up on some everyday things that need to be addressed and taken care of by us, people of District 26, people of the state of Oklahoma. I appreciate the steps that the legislature took this last year in getting the ball rolling on uh, funding education. We've got to go forward with it. Um, we still are lagging behind in that aspect. So we'll be making some tough decisions in the next year, two years to come, longer than that. I really want to do this. My family had initially thought I was out of my mind, uh, but this is something I want to do. So I unabashedly ask for your vote on November 6th. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Ferg, and Dr. Hopkins. Folks, I did not introduce when we got started. We have Senator Ron Sharp with us this evening. Senator Sharp, thank you for being here. And we have Representative Danny Sterling is also here. Danny, thank you both for being here. Did I miss anyone else, one of our elected officials? Well, thank you for being here. We'll take just a quick minute here to change our format for our judges, and if you did not get to participate in the poll, in the fishbowl poll, please uh, do that real quickly here. Thank you. would come forward please <laughs> Tracy McDaniel and Kelly McCuller will get started time now for our judge candidates. Because of judicial independence, we try, we do not allow questions from the floor for our judges, but we do allow them to have the opportunity to really give their judicial philosophy and anything else they'd like to share with us. We did a coin flip earlier this evening and Kelly McCuller uh, won the uh, flip of the coin. So uh, 
each has five minutes. If they need five minutes, they have five minutes each. So with that, Ms. McCuller. Thank you. I want to thank PAVE and everyone who showed up to participate and watch the participants. Um, I feel confident about that coin toss. I just want to tell you that. I'm good to be first now. Maybe I'll be first later on the ballot in November. <laughs> I sure would appreciate your vote. I am Kelly McCuller. I was born and raised here in Shawnee, Oklahoma. I have uh, extensive family and friends here, aunts, uncles, and cousins. And I was thinking today, I have grandchildren, but I also have great nieces and nephews. I was thinking, I'm a great aunt, and thank goodness for that. Uh, I, uh, my family was from here, my grandparents were from here, they've all ran businesses here, um, and I uh, went to school here. I ended up dropping out of high school when I was in the 12th grade, my last year of high school. I dropped out of high school and, and uh, got off balance there for a little bit, and I told people if you'd like to ask me about that, you can ask me later. I have five minutes. Have you ever seen a lawyer that only talked for five minutes? I mean, we just can't get it all in, so I'm going to do the best that I can. Uh, but I, I was a high school dropout, and I had some difficulties, and I later back, went back to college when I was in my 20s at uh, Seminole State College. It was Seminole Junior College at the time, a long time ago. and. Uh, didn't know that I wasn't supposed to apply or be able to get in. I just went in and said I want to schedule and I took the required classes to be able to be a high school graduate and uh, did so well. I was, not, uh, was not confident about college because uh, high school didn't make me very confident in that after dropping out. Um, and I did well. I mean, I made really good grades. I believe I had a 3.8 when I graduated from Seminole State College and business was my focus. And then I decided that I wanted to become an attorney. I uh, went to the University of Oklahoma and for some reason, it's not required to be an attorney to take the most difficult classes at the Michael F. Price College of Business, so I did that. I'm not sure why I did that. No one told me I could have any bachelor's degree to go to law school, but I did and I made a 3.63 and I was on the Dean's Honor Roll. I've been in the National Golden Key uh, National Honor so Society. After I left OU, it was a much more struggle to get into college at uh, Oklahoma City University. It is the only college that I applied to, law school that I applied to, and the reason was is because I was a working mom, have two children I was raising at the time, and uh, I needed to be able to keep my daytime job to be able to support my children while I went to law school. Uh, and I also did that when I went to the University of Oklahoma and I took night classes, I took day classes, I took weekend classes throughout my college career to be able to graduate and have the career that I chose, that I wanted to have. I went to, I was accepted to Oklahoma City University School of Law, which I am uh, honored by and, and dumbfounded still sometimes these days. Uh, it was a very difficult law school to go to, um, uh, kind of, uh, T tough people to deal with there. Uh, went to night classes for a period of time. I was a legal intern for my, uh, that became my law partner, it was my husband at the time, and I interned in his office. He did a variety of cases. Uh, we did family law, criminal law. Uh, he had worked at uh, OIDS, which is Oklahoma Indigent Defense System, and he had gotten extensive experience with the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, Criminal Appeals, and the Supreme Court and briefing. And so he just threw me in there and told me to do it. And I didn't, was like, okay, I'll do it. Uh, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I began uh, practicing uh, in federal and state courts. I am experienced in both courts and I'm licensed to practice in the Western District and Eastern District of Oklahoma. I don't go to Northern District because it's too far and I do enough as it is here in town. Uh, I also had federal and state court trial experience. My first trial was in federal court in the Western District of Oklahoma the year that I was sworn in as an attorney. I was co-chair with my partner at the time. It was a case that I had worked on for the whole entire time that I was a legal intern, uh, and I had done the whole entire case with them, everything that you're supposed to do. My practice has been varied. I have done family law. I have done some criminal law. I have, uh, I, I have worked for this position to become a judge. I think a, a lot of lawyers would like to be a judge. I believe that I can bring fairness and partiality to the bench. My skills experience are also what I bring to the bench. 
and, and just common sense that you have to have in private practice. And I believe that my practice has prepared me for that. And I'm asking for your vote for Kelly McCuller on November 6th. And thank you for your attention. I sure appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. McCuller. Ms. McDaniel? Thank you. We only have a short amount of time, so I'm probably going to talk really fast. I want to tell you a little bit about myself and about the steps that I've taken to prepare myself to be the next associate district judge for Pottawatomie County. I'm a product of Shawnee Public Schools. I am the daughter of retired educators, Gary and Marion Salverac. My husband, Tim McDaniel, is in his 23rd year of teaching at Shawnee Middle School, and we have three children. Our oldest son, Garrett, is a senior in college. Our one and only daughter, Mackenzie, is a senior in high school, and our youngest son, Jace, is in fourth grade. The do job of associate district judge in Pottawatomie County handles the following cases, family law, juvenile delinquents and deprives, adoptions, protective orders, mental health, drug court revocations, and jury trials, including civil, juvenile, and criminal. I've been licensed to practice law in the state of Oklahoma for, the first, for 18 years. For the first 11 and a half years, I worked in a private practice where probably 70 to 75% of what I did was family law, juvenile law, and adoptions. I got to be pretty good at that. I also did real estate, wills and trusts, probates and guardianships, the types of things that you do in a general private practice. Now fast forward to 2011, Justice Combs was appointed to the Supreme Court of Oklahoma and the governor appointed my law partner to be his partner. So I was now a solo practitioner, and at that point, um, I was a solo practitioner, and I had to decide what was I going to do at that point. Um, was I gonna keep going on in my private practice or go work for the district attorney's office? Because the district attorney had called me at that point and asked me if I would come work for him full time to handle juvenile, to handle juvenile delinquent and deprived cases and civil cases. Sally was trying to make me stop talking three minutes too early. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I had to decide what I was going to do. At this point, I was also aware that Judge Gardner was talking about the fact that he might be close to retiring. So to make myself more well-rounded well, well for this position, I took the job in the DA's office. For the next five and a half years, I prosecuted the juvenile delinquent and deprived cases in both counties, and I handled the civil government matters for the county. Now, fast forward to 2016, Associate District Judge Gardner retired, and then Special District Judge Engel was appointed to his position. So, I had another career decision to make. Was I going to stay at the DA's office and keep doing my juvenile and civil work, or would I apply to be the next special district judge. This may sound like a no-brainer decision since I told you at the beginning I was going to tell you the steps I took to become judge, but it was a twofold problem for me. Number one, I really loved the juvenile work that I did. I cared about the kids that I dealt with and I cared about their families, and I really felt that I was more suited for the associate district judge position. I ultimately decided to become the special district judge and was fortunate enough to be appointed to that position which again prepares me for this associate district judge, not just because it gave me judicial experience, but the one area of law that I had not spent a lot of time in was criminal law. And as the special district judge, I do a lot of family law, I do protective orders, I do some juvenile and mental health work, but I also handle all of the misdemeanor revocations in Pottawatomie County, and I handle all of the felony preliminary hearings and youthful offender cases in Lincoln County. So at this point, the way I look at it, I am the one candidate who has 18 years of experience doing every single type of job that the associate district judge in Pottawatomie County handles. And I have experience in that job from three different perspectives. The, that of the private practitioner, the prosecutor, and as a judge. At this point, I'm seeking this job not for notoriety, it's the family court position. It's not a job that you generally hear about. But I want to be your next associate district judge because it's the type of work that I do, it's who I am, it's what I know, and it's what I'll strive to do better each day if I'm fortunate enough to get your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> that concludes our section for judicial candidates.
And now we'll take a short break and be ready for our District 23 District Attorney candidates. I can read that. I might get by this one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad she said something. Did you get did you give me that paper on Jeannie? Jeannie. Where did that do with it? Have you got it? Oh, I'm on, aren't I? Ready to start? We ready to go? I've got one announcement before we start this race. Uh, Jeannie Stover, Pottawatomie County Election Board Secretary, reported there will also be early voting Thursday and Friday, November 1 and 2, 
8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and on Saturday, November the 3rd, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. One other announcement, you've got about 20 minutes and that's it on the fishbowl. Uh, we're, we're going to start counting in about 20 minutes, so please go. If you did not get to vote on the questions, we would appreciate your vote. I know, you're ready to hear this hot race, okay. <laughs> Good evening, <clears throat> my name is Ronnie Perry Sharp. I will be your moderator for this last race. It is the 23rd judici judicial, I can talk, district race, uh, which includes Lincoln County and Pottawatomie County. Running for district attorney is Democrat Adam Painter, Republican Alan Grubb. And again, earlier we tossed a coin and Adam Painter will go first. Thank you, Ron. Uh, my name is Adam Painter. I'm the current first assistant district attorney for Pottawatomie and Lincoln counties. Um, I'd like to say hi to my beautiful wife back there. Um, I'd like to thank PAVE for allowing us to put on this, to have this forum so that we can come talk to you guys today. And I'd also like to thank Alan for participating and also thank him to, uh, up to this point, running a clean campaign. Uh, I appreciate that. I know some of his close advisors have tried to get him to do otherwise and he's resisted, so I appreciate that on a personal level. Uh, my career began at the Pottawatomie County DA's office uh, as an assistant district attorney under Richard Smotherman. Um, during that time, during my entire professional career has spent, been spent at the Pottawatomie County DA's office as a prosecutor. I've prosecuted the worst of the worst cases in this county for the past decade. The rapes, the murderers, uh, the child abusers, the, the, all the violent crimes have come through me. The hard cases. I've worked my way up through the office until I began, was promoted to the first assistant DA under Mr. Smugman. During that time, I've become one of the most successful and experienced trial prosecutors in this state. And I want to keep doing that for this county. Um, representing the state of Oklahoma against those people that will victimize and harm other Oklahomans is my calling. I plan to modernize the DA's office. I plan to bring our standards up to what cur the current societal standards are for what a prosecutor is to be. I want to be proactive with this office. My goal is to be more proactive along with reactive. We have to start fighting the issues we deal with on a daily basis, not just at the end when it's too far gone, but also at the root of the problem. I'm doing that by implementing a mental health court and juvenile drug courts, in addition to other alternative courts, as long as the funding is there and available. We're seeking criminal justice reform in a common sense way that does not disregard the rights of the victim. The stakes are too high in this race to leave in the hands of an office. Thank you. Republican Alan Grubb. I want to thank Pay for hosting this event and for everyone that took the time to come out of their busy schedules this evening. I also want to thank my wife and my kids for dealing with uh, this campaign cycle. It's been long. I've been running a race since March when I thought Mr. Smotherman was going to be my opponent. Uh, I'm Alan Grubb and I'm a Republican running for district attorney. I'm seeking this office because I care about my community and I'm dedicated to reducing crime and increasing public safety in Pottawatomie and Lincoln County. As a four decade resident of this area, I'm weary of seeing the horrific acts of violent crime fill our local headlines. Our current method of reacting to these tragic situations is not working and it's time for the district attorney to take a lead in proactively addressing root causes associated with antisocial behavior. As a father of three beautiful daughters, I am dedicated to creating safe neighborhoods for all of our <laughs> citizens. Issues of addiction and mental illness are better addressed through treatment and, and mental health care. I believe in helping people who need help and am committed to putting away people who are a legitimate threat to the community. I promise to work hard to enhance public safety, strengthen families, and improve the quality of life in District 23. We can do better. We deserve better. I respectfully ask for your vote on November 6th for district attorney. It's time for a change. Thank you. 
You've just heard opening remarks from both candidates. Now we will start our question and answer <clears throat> moment. This first question is for both of the candidates. We will start with Adam Painter. Violent crime in Lincoln and Pottawatomie County continues to increase at a time when incarceration rates are at an all-time high. Mass incarceration does not appear to be effective in reducing crime rates. What is your solution for increasing public safety? My solution to increase public safety is to continue to be aggressive to those who are, who are going to victimize members of our communities. Uh, we cannot sit back and just allow someone to reign free and victimize uh, those of us who, or those who have done nothing or are innocent of all, um, anything at all who never chose to be a victim of crime, to be uh, preyed upon by others. Uh, how we do that? We implement more alternative programs. Um, more mental health courts, we need more funding. We gotta get mental health courts in place, and that's something I'm currently working on. We have to expand our drug courts. We have to do a better job drug courts and training. We have to get um, more, we have to get more upfront funding from our state government to fully fund DA's offices. Right now, the district attorney's office is funded at 29%. 29% of our budget is funded by the, by the state of Oklahoma. The rest of those funds come from grants we have to beg for from the federal government, and they come from other sources where we have to dig for for ourselves. Can you imagine running a business where you walk in and your boss says, run this, do all this, but we're only gonna give you 29% of the budget you need to do that. That is insane cannot run a state office like that. They, we're underfunded, we're underpaid, and part of my goal is to get us funded and paid as we need to be so that we can start serving the members of our community as we should be, even better than we are now. Candidate Grubb, would you like me to repeat the question? Please. All right, it's long. Violent crime in Lincoln and Pottawatomie County continues to increase at a time <clears throat> when incarceration rates are an all-time high. Mass incarceration does not appear to be effective in reducing crime rates. What is your solution for increasing public safety? My solution is almost exactly what is is Increase the programs, the mental health court, the veterans courts, uh, the fundings have been there. Seminole County, one of the poorest counties in the state, has had Veterans Court and Mental Health Court for approximately 10 years. Um, we need these programs in this county. Along with that, we need more programs uh, where we can do increased probation at lower level crimes. Uh, what I mean by that is deferred prosecution agreements so that we can monitor more closely and effectively people before they get into a serious drug habit. Uh, I would like to see the DA's office take the lead on involving community groups to help with supervision and probation, to help with trying to create mentor programs, to help with, uh, with for example, the veterans, whenever they come back and, and you have somebody that has issues, uh, one of the programs there can be getting veterans jobs. Those things are all things I want to do. It's been on the back of my material since March, uh, and I believe that I'm the person to do it. I believe if, if we were going to do it in this office with this administration and, and my opponent, with all due respect, uh, it should have been done years ago. The funding's been there, the <coughs> function and the, the setup has been there to do it, and it just has not been done or even talked about. Thank you. Next question is for both candidates again, and we will start with Republican Alan Grubb. <coughs> How many domestic violence sexual assault victims have you represented? And how many favorable outcomes for the victim? What programs will you have to support them? I've represented probably three or 400 uh, in domestic cases, uh, deprived, deprived cases, and uh, victims protective order type cases. We need, Project SAFE's a great program. Uh, they do a real good job with getting the victims help. Uh, they, they could use a little bit more support from uh, the DA's office. I think, and this is part of what I believe, if you ever go to one of the jury trial dockets and watch, you'll see 
probably 60%, roughly 60% of the people that are charged with domestic abuse walking out of there with their case dismissed. If we treat each of those cases like we would a murder case, where we gather the evidence up front, where we don't have to have the victim testify, then we could prosecute those cases and get those defendants the help that they need so that they won't reoffend and we won't create more victims. And that's what we have to do as a community. Thank you. Same question to Democrat <clears throat> Adam Painter. How many domestic violence sexual assault victims have you represented and how many favorable outcomes for the victim? What programs will you have to support them? Uh, well, since Alan didn't answer the question for you, I'll tell you his answer is none. None. He has never sat in a room with a domestic violence or victim or a victim of sexual assault and received a favorable outcome to him because he's never been a prosecutor and he's never truly done them any justice. I have. I've spent my entire career doing it. Now let me address this, this, the statistics there. This district attorney's office is above the national average when it comes to domestic violence prosecutions and we're above the state average. But the reality is domestic violence victims, on average, uh, go through the prosecution process seven times before they decide to, to, finally, to finally follow through and help us uh, stop the abuse. That means the DA's office that we're under We'll help them the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. We will keep helping them if that includes dismissing their cases and refiling until they are ready to come forward and hopefully to save their life in this case. Domestic violence is an issue that is near and dear to me because that is something that I've fought day in and day out for a long time. And I understand the cycle of violence that a domestic violence or a victim of sexual assault goes through. And the reality is my opponent, the only time he sat in a room with an actual victim of domestic or sexual assault is to convince them not to come in and testify against his client. Project SAFE, law enforcement, district attorney's offices across the state rely on grants right now because the state of Oklahoma does not fund us adequately to be able to prosecute. We have to rely on the Violence Against Women Act and other grants to be able to prosecute these crimes. The reality is if we force a victim to trial, if we say, I don't care if you want to testify or not, you're going to trial, not only does the DA's office lose the grant money from that, from those grants, law enforcement, project safe, DA's offices lose untold numbers of staff and money from the government. We have to follow the rules that are given us to us to use the funds that are provided to us to keep fighting the issue. Time. Our next question is for both candidates. Uh, this time we will start with Adam Painter. We have been so much of a good old boy town, going way back. Do you plan any changes to make things different? Uh, well, I, I don't know if I'm a member of the good old boy club. Um, I, I've been coming to work for the past 10 years and doing my job. Uh, matter of fact, I, I don't even think I knew half the good old boys up until uh, this, this election cycle when people started introducing themselves. And frankly, I'm not one to be bought, I'm not one to be sold, and that frightens a lot of people in this town, and that's probably why I have an opponent in this case. They know that I'm in this office to do a job, and I'm not here to do any types of favors for anyone because I don't care to do favors for anyone. I'm here to do a job to help the people of this community, regardless of any, anybody behind the scene. Now, my opponent's already labeled me as the same person as my boss. My boss is Richard Smugman. His name is on the door. I do what my boss tells me just like any of you would do if your boss told you. I'm not Richard Smugman, and I agree with Alan in his opening statement. There needs to be change in the DA's office, and that's through me. Thank you. Same question to Republican Alan Grubb. We have been so much of a good old boy town, going way back. Do you plan any changes to make things different? Well, I planned a change when I announced my election in March and thought I was running against the good old boy candidate, Richard. So. My answer is yes. I intend to change that system and not be part of it. Thank you. To the point. Next question, once again, is for both candidates. Uh, we will start with Republican Alan Grubb. Do you favor making the DA's race nonpartisan? Why or why not? No, I don't. I think there are several reasons. Uh, one is your party gives you a core value set. Uh, of what you believe. You either believe in smaller government, larger government, uh, 
Like right now, we have one of the largest DA's offices that we've ever had in this county. Uh, I'm not a fan of big government, uh, never have been. Um, but there's, I think, 27 people in the state of Oklahoma that can ask for the death penalty, a core issue for Republicans. Uh, the DA's are 26 of those. So I think it's a very relevant discussion and a very party discussion. Same question to candidate Adam Painter. Do you favor making the DA's race nonpartisan? Why or why not? I believe the DA should be absolutely nonpartisan. Once you start bringing politics into the realm of district attorney, the DA's job is the Minister of Justice. That means you are to make decisions based on the law and the facts alone. Once you bring political parties into the issue, you bring bias into the issue. If you have bias in your decision making, you're not truly seeking justice. You're seeking your own ends. It doesn't matter what you believe politically, you look at the law and you apply the law to the facts. Our DA's office is, hasn't been the largest it's ever been. Our DA's office has the same amount of attorneys as it had in the 1980s with double the filings and probably triple the work. This DA's office, and Mr. Grubb spoke about the death penalty. Of course the death penalty is an important thing because that's an important power the DA, that the DA wields. It's probably one of the most important powers that they do wield. But if you start putting your political leanings into the selection of the death penalty, then you, then you infuse bias in that decision. I am a Democrat, that's right. That's my political party, but that is not who I am because I'm not a politician, I'm a prosecutor. And every time the issue, uh, every time the facts presented itself on a murder charge, that I've been a part of that factually could be supported, that the death penalty could be sought in that case, we have sought, including two pending right now. Politics do not play a role in the DA's office. There are too many politics, that's what's wrong with politics today. There are too many politicians out here that believe in R by the name or D by the name makes them qualified to carry the position. My opinion is if that's all you're relying on to be able to get a position, then you're wholly unqualified for the job and shouldn't be seeking it. Thank you. This next question, again, is for both candidates. We will start with Democratic Adam Painter. Do you support the District Attorney's Council approving and accepting a 6% raise to themselves, which now actually has them making more than the statutes allow? That is 98% of the district judge salary while the state is struggling. Well, first off, that's not true. The DA salary is set by state law. You can't violate state law to set your own salaries, no matter how much you want to put a political spin on it. Um, the DA salary is set by statute, and it's 99% of what the district judge makes, and the district judge make salary is set by law. Um, I believe, though, that this state sorely underpays its state employees. The problem we're faced with right now is not DA pay. It's pay across the state. State employees are some of the most underpaid employees there are that we deal with on a daily basis. And not just state employees, but our educators, our, our first responders, and that's a problem that starts at the state capitol, not at the DA's offices. That's a state capital issue, and that's an, a problem that's endemic on this state. Far too often do we sit back and slash budgets and slash budgets and slash budgets up at the legislative level while all these pu core public functions suffer just so people can say, we're doing our best to slash or to, to get rid of the waste. Well, there is no waste to get rid of anymore. I believe, though, that if there is extra money to pay people, that's, that's money that should be going to the state employees. And, and that's something I would make sure that happens because I would make sure, as first assistant, and I have made sure, and you can ask any employee at the DA's office, that we make sure <coughs> your pay is raised whenever we have the funds to do it. No, no. Uh, I don't believe it's appropriate for DAs to be taking a pay raise this year. I think we are all of the agreement that teachers need the pay raise and first responders. The state employees have went without a pay raise for years. They will be the next that need a pay raise. Uh, right now is not the time for district attorneys or district judges to be taking a pay raise. I will say I believe the law is 98% of a district judge's salary, so I think he's wrong on that. Uh, we need to save money where we can save money. The DA's council did vote a 6% pay raise to district attorneys this year. Um, 
whatever facts he's quoting are wrong. Um, so that needs to be looked at. They're a self-interested group that does have the ability to give themselves raise if they're not already at the maximum by statute. Uh, since the justices and the judges did not take the pay raise, that will cause a legal problem because the district judge didn't take a pay raise, but they have a statutory limit. The DA can now make more than the judge. It's, it sets itself up from problems. The DAC, District Attorney's Council, knew that when they did it. Um, and I think it's a bad policy decision. So no, I don't think it's a good idea. No, I won't give myself that raise. Thank you. Next question, both candidates. We will start with Republican Alan Grubb. What are your thoughts on people going to prison first time simple drug possession charges? I don't think that's really appropriate. I think, I think you've got to attack that problem at the base and deal with the antisocial behavior to get treatment meaningfully. Uh, almost on a daily basis in the beginning. You've got to monitor those people severely and you've got to watch them for relapses. People fall into relapse and we do not catch that soon enough and under the current system, by the time we catch it, a lot of the times there's nothing we can do because they've lost their house, they've lost their car, they've lost their kids, they've lost their job. We have to monitor it as a community on almost a daily basis. It's gonna take a lot more work up front. The easiest thing you can do as a prosecutor is send people to prison. The hardest thing is to keep somebody out. I want to put the work in up front. Um, also, I think the statistics show, the statistics for 2018, Baltimore County, 77% are nonviolent offenders that have went to prison. 80% of those are first time offenders. We are not putting the effort in in this county to keep first time offenders out of jail. We have to do that up front because when we send a nonviolent offender to prison, and he goes and gets abused in prison, beat in prison, raped in prison, or she, then they come back out and reinflict that on us. It does not help our communities. It does not help the person. And we have to take care of the problem as a community. We deserve better. We have to do better. Same question to Democrat Adam Painter. What are your thoughts on people going to prison, first time simple drug possession charges? In my decade as a prosecutor, not one person has gone to prison for a first time possession of CDS charge. <clears throat> not one person. None. It doesn't happen. Now, there's a lot of people out there that sling misleading stats to pu push their own political agendas, but that is not the reality that we deal with. On a daily basis, the reality is if you have a first time simple possession, A, it's a misdemeanor. You get probation. You don't go to jail, period, for a misdemeanor, rarely. But B, even if you are, even if it was a felony, but back before the law changed, you didn't go to prison on a first time nonviolent non felony. You went through multiple levels of probation, sometimes six or seven or eight, before you finally get to the point where we have no more resources, nothing else to throw at them, and then what are you left with with a person that continues to victimize the community, continues to use drugs, continues to drag their children into that cycle of violence, you have no other choice to send them to prison. The reality is then they go in for a couple months and come out. First time simple possession offenders do not go to prison unless they break into prison. Um, our, philosophy, our philosophy has been to get those people the treatment that they need. The treatment that they need. The reality is you can't hold a gun to their head. And I know Mr. Grubbs had talked about small business owners mentoring and stuff. I asked Mr. Grubb, how many, how many felons have you employed as a small business owner in this town to mentor them? The answer is five. zero. The answer is zero. You asked me a question, it's five. The reality is the programs and the funding out there are severely <laughs> lacking for people who, are, who, who suffer from substance abuse and mental illness. There are not funds out there right now for available uh, alternative courts. This is the first year in 15 years that the state, government, state legislature has granted additional funds for us to implement a mental health court, and we are finally going to get it because we are at the top of our, their list because our DA's office has been advocating for it for years. Time. Next question, again, for both candidates. We will start with Republican Alan Grubb. What are your plans for the One Safe Place Family Justice Center and other juvenile programs? I believe the One First Place Juvenile Justice Center has a value to our community. Uh, we've not seen it reach its full potential. I think 
to victims that can reach its full potential under the right leadership. I think it's going to take a lot of upfront time. Uh, I believe that that will be a great program once it's, once it's fully functioning. Uh, there's going to be a lot of programs. Uh, we need diversionary programs in, in some cases where there's families involved. Uh, I was part of a program here for about 10 years. Uh, uh, can't remember the name of it, Safe Haven. We provided uh, structure for families. We stayed in contact with the individuals. We stayed in contact with the children and the family to make sure that they didn't fall into the cycle of relapse. That was a really good program for supporting and uplifting families in our community, and it got many on their feet to where they could become tax-paying, productive citizens. Again, a win for any of my programs is a day we keep people clean, out of jail, not harming our community, and keep them from being felons and make them pay taxes is a win. Those are wins. Every single day we achieve that result is a win, and that's my goal. Thank you. Same question to Democrat Adam Painter. What are your plans for the One Safe Place Family Justice Center and other juvenile programs? At the beginning of this race, uh, my opponent told people that the FJC, the Family Justice Center, was the biggest waste of money we have in this community. I disagree with that statement. The Family Justice Center is a very core function of this community. I was in it, is, I was in on it when it was just a dream of Richard Smotherman. We built it from the ground up. We've secured grant funding. We've secured buildings. We've secured employees. We built the thing from nothing, following no blueprint, because a rural Family Justice Center is one of, we're one of the first communities in the country to develop one. This is a facility that helps victims of rape, it helps victims of domestic violence, it helps victims of child abuse, and it helps victims of child neglect. It is a victim-centered facility. It is not there for addicts to come wandering in for treatment. This is a center for victims to be used, to, to use. It steers them to the proper uh, advocates, whether that's uh, legal aid to help victims of domestic violence, um, uh, and to be able to alter child custody orders or, or get paternity established. Um, it helps uh, victims of rape. Uh, there's sane nurses, sexual assault nurse examiners. They're there to do examinations for them on rape kits during investigations. It has a forensic interview center where forensic interviewers are able to uh, interview children that are victims of abuse and neglect, uh, get the proper type of interview techniques for uh, uh, police investigations or report DHS child welfare investigations. We are at its infancy right now, and this is something that I'm passionate about because my expertise in my entire career has been child abuse and neglect. I'm, I'm an expert in child abuse and neglect and abuse prosecutions. This is something that's very near and dear to me. We are going to grow the Family Justice Center because we're, we're going to let it, get it to its full potential, and we're not even scratching the surface yet. But it is going to be a shining example under my leadership for the entire country, for every rural community in this country to come in and look at and say, that's how it's done and that's what we want. Next question for both candidates, uh, Democrat Adam Painter, what is your position on the death penalty? Uh, I kind of said that earlier, I'm, I'm for the death penalty, I'm not opposed to the death penalty. I believe in my 10 years here, now again, the death penalty is ultimate, uh, it, it, the DA's got the ultimate call in the case, um, and I'm not the district attorney, so I don't get to make the decisions. Uh, but I'm for the death penalty. Uh, I've been a part of six death penalty prosecutions. We have two pending right now. Last uh, Two weeks ago, we filed what's called a bill of particulars on a death penalty case in Lincoln County, seeking it on a terrible child abuse case, one of the worst I've seen in my career. Uh, I'm not anti-death penalty. But the death penalty has to be wielded responsibly because ultimately it is state-sanctioned murder. And if you do not have a DA that's able to wield that power responsibly, you're going to have a tyrant on your hands. But not include. even more than that, you can't just seek the death penalty on every murder case. There have to be things called aggravators present. Now, I remember at the beginning of this, uh, this election, we actually sat down in a room with my opponent, and he said that we don't file enough death penalty cases. And when I said, how are you going to figure out what aggravators to file in these cases, he didn't even understand what an aggravator was. That is the most basic thing you should know as a prosecutor when filing the death penalty is that you have to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt not just the murder itself, but the presence beyond a reasonable doubt of one of seven aggravators. 
And if you do not have those aggravators, no matter what your thoughts are on a murder, if you cannot prove those in a courtroom, you cannot file the death bill. Thank you. Same question to Republican Alan Grubb. What is your position on the death penalty? My position is it needs to be used more. It needs to be used judiciously, but it needs to be used. It doesn't just need to be used in an election year. It needs to be used every day of the year. Uh, it needs to be used as a deterrent to stop the horrific crimes to children that are happening in our neighborhoods and cities and towns. That would be a great detractor from the child abuse that he ends up having to prosecute. Uh, I just am a firm believer that the death penalty is a deterrent, and I believe it needs to be used. And children victims are an aggravator. No, they're not. But we do it. Can't give rebuttal. Um, I apologize. Sorry. Okay. Next question for both candidates. <clears throat> we will start with Republican Alan Grubb. Since 780 and 781 are now law, what other ideas do you have or plan to implement if elected, since even meth sellers would be misdemeanors? We need to track, I don't think meth sellers will be misdemeanors. I, I think that's wrong. Uh, that's a presumption that's not accurate. Who wrote that question doesn't I know. understand the law. I'm just reading from the I book. understand. Um, Mess sellers will not be misdemeanors. Mess sellers will still be felonies. Uh, marijuana could potentially be a misdemeanor now under the new law. We need to implement the new laws, figure out where we are with them, and follow them. Uh, we need to figure out a good way through probation to address the continuing problem of drug abuse and mental health issues by tracking the people and understanding their problems and getting them the help they need. Adam Payne, would you want me to? No, ma'am. Um, 780 and 781, as everybody knows, were uh, law, state laws passed, uh, I believe, in November of 2016. Uh, they were implemented in July of 2017 as state law. Once 780 and 781 were passed, um, as many of you know, that's what brought all simple possession of any drugs, whether it be marijuana or heroin or cocaine, down to a misdemeanor. Um, when that law was passed, this district attorney's office under Richard Smotherman and myself, we came together, we, we formed a plan to bring this DA's office's views in line with the public's views at that point. We said the public voted on it, it passed. <coughs> This public on simple possession charges filed as misdemeanors. We didn't have to at that point, but we implemented a plan at that point to start filing all felony possession charges as misdemeanors. In fact, we were we, and it was not required, but we were such at the forefront of it that other DA's offices across the state copied our plan and implemented it in place. Um, that's what I mean by modernizing the DA's office before. We have to bring the DA's office's views on how we deal with certain crimes in line with what society wants, with what the community wants, because the district attorney is held accountable to society, to our community. And if the community says, we want these prosecuted like this, this is what we do. And we've jumped on it, and we have a track record of jumping on it and following those guidelines. Um, we also have to be smart about how we do it, because we can't forget that 780 and 781 also affected property crimes. Um, but we also have to take into account when you have a property crime, you have a victim. There's a victim involved here, so you have to also include them into your decision making. Thank you. Next question, and we will start with Adam Painter this time. What experience do you have managing significant amounts of money and budgets? Currently, I manage approximately 50, 40 to 50 employees across two counties and three offices. Uh, we have the Pottawatomie County DA's office, the main office. We have the Lincoln County DA's office, main office in Chandler. We have Child Support Enforcement Division here in Shawnee. We have a Drug and Violent Crimes Task Force. And uh, we have employees that are, that are uh, stationed at the Family Justice Center. We have a budget of $3.2 million. Again, $3.2 million that's only funded at 29% by the state of Oklahoma. That means that you just don't get to walk in with a $3.2 million check from the state and saying, we're taking care of this this year. What that means is you have to be very careful across numerous employees, across multiple counties, 
across budget sources and monies that are coming from numerous directions, and you have to be able to manage that budget in a way, because the DA's office, if you overspend and you go in the red, you don't just get to turn around and file for bankruptcy. That's not allowed. You have to keep your lights on, you have to keep employees employed, and you have to keep prosecuting because it's not about which, how you want to spend your money, it's about how you can spend your money and to do it the most effectively, effective way possible to keep seeking justice for your victims. I've been doing this for a couple of years now as the first assistant, and that's one of our core functions is to not only manage that office, but to manage the budget. Thank you. Republican Alan Grubb, same question. What experience do you have managing significant amounts of money and budgets? Uh, in the 90s, I was a director with the dot-com company in Austin. Uh, we were a Fortune 500 company. I've had probably 120 direct employees uh, spread out over three cities, Austin, Chicago, and Houston. Uh, did that for several years. Uh, that company suffered in the dot-com bubble burst. Everybody I knew lost significant money in 2001. Uh, I ran my own law office at always a cash positive since 2004. Uh, I, I guess my opponent thinks that in private business you, you have to, or you can just file bankruptcy. I've never filed bankruptcy. I don't know where he comes up with that. Uh, I run in a property <laughs> business. I own rental properties. Uh, I've always ran those at a cash positive business. I believe that you have to be able to manage all your resources, no matter what position you're in, effectively and reasonably. So. Thank you. Next question uh, is for both candidates. It's a lengthy question, but uh, significant. We will start with Adam Painter. Do you believe your duty as district attorney is owed more to protecting citizens and enforcing the law or to protect the rights of the offenders. Why? Justify your answer with your platform's plan for action if you are elected. How will your plan work better than your opponent? God, it's a lengthy. <laughs> two part. We get more than two minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> Can't change the rules. <laughs> uh, my answer is both. Um, both. You have a. The district attorney, by definition, is called is a minister of justice. A minister of justice means that you seek justice, but you also ensure that, that um, the rights of all parties involved are not infringed. That means that if you sit back and you know that a defendant's rights are going to be infringed by some action that you're going to take, you cannot take it. You are morally and ethically obligated not to do that. We are bound within the constraints of the law. We cannot become lawbreakers ourselves, no matter how terrible a person is on the other side. That is what's called being a minister of justice. It's called we wear the white hat. We make decisions based on the law, and you apply the law. Protecting the public, yeah, I believe, is the DA's office core function. But we have to protect the public, the public in a way that does not infringe upon the rights of everybody. Because once a district attorney starts infringing upon the rights of a criminal, what's next? That means they can start infringing upon your rights. A district attorney builds massive amounts of power. With the stroke of a pen, one of the things I teach our young prosecutors, with the stroke of a pen, you, can, you have the capability to ruin somebody's life. If I pick up the charge and I file, I file against Ms. Sharp right here, a felony charge, whether it is, there is supported by evidence or not, that is something that will stick with her record for the rest of her life, and that could end up, they can ruin people's lives. That is a power you must wield responsible. Now, that is something that you have to wield across the board. My plans in I, this district attorney's office, and I have run things as honestly and as ethically and as openly as absolutely possible. I believe that transparency in government and how we make decisions is one of the absolute biggest uh, things out there. Every time I file a murder charge and sit in a room with a murder victim's family, I explain to them every single reality in this case because once you start lying to people about the realities of the case, you go down a rabbit hole you cannot escape from. It is always best to be honest and forthcoming and transparent, and I'm out of time. time. <laughs> I, could, I could talk all night, I'm sorry. Let me uh, yeah, you know, repeat that. Yes, it, it's two part. <clears throat> we'll hear from Republican Alan Grubb now. Do you believe your duty as district attorney is owed more to protecting citizens and enforcing the law 
or to protect the rights of the offenders. Why? Justify your answer with your platform's plan for action if you are elected. How will your plan work better than your opponents? Well, I believe that the prosecutor's chief job is to protect the public. Yes, they're supposed to wear the white hats, and if there are circumstances that cause somebody not to be prosecuted, then they have to give that to the other side. It's, it's a duty. Uh, his answer was very good. I, I agree with most of it. Um, I believe that our foremost job is to make sure the law is carried out in an equal fashion to everyone that, that gets in trouble and to make sure that we protect the community and then to make sure that the offenders are given a fair shot to make sure that their defense attorneys are doing their job. Uh, not all defense attorneys are created equal. And to make sure that we protect the offenders that we can from hurting themselves. With through the programs to get mental health treatment, to get drug treatment, uh, to get them the help they need so that they stop offending. Thank you. That was our last question uh, for this evening because we're running out of time. At this time, we will hear closing statements and we will begin with Republican Alan Grove. Again, I want to thank Pay for hosting this event and for everyone that took the time to come this evening. I'm asking for your vote because I want to make our community safer. By implementing proven solutions and effective approaches to prosecution that focus on locking up people that are dangerous while at the same time working to rehabilitate people who battle addiction and mental illness. I will be a champion of victims' rights. I believe we can come together as a community to help low-level offenders turn their lives around and become productive members of the community. I will work to expand programs for struggling veterans. My goal is to strengthen and rebuild families and make Pottawatomie and Lincoln counties an even better place to raise our children. Again, I'm Alan Grubb, and I'm respectfully asking for your vote on November 6th. It's time for a change. At this time, we will hear closing statements by Democrat Adam Painter. Ladies and gentlemen, the stakes are too high right now. Uh, the stakes are too high. We deserve a DA. This community deserves a DA, a district attorney with honesty, integrity, and experience. Not a Republican, not a Democrat, not a politician, this community needs a prosecutor. I am a prosecutor. This is not a job for me. This is my calling. This is my passion. And I'm not just good at it, I'm one of the best at it. And I'm going to leave you all with this. Imagine yourself, or imagine a horrible, senseless, traumatic a rape, a murder, violent crime, some type of abuse. Imagine this. Now imagine that victim. Imagine the pain. Imagine the suffering. Imagine the trauma. Imagine the fear. Now imagine that's your child. Imagine that's your loved one. Imagine it's you. That is a reality that many people are dealing with right now in this community. Who do you want prosecuting? Him, or do you want me? That. I've been forging the fires of trial. I've been forging those fires, and that is why I'm here today. Because those are the those. That is what is at stake. That is the reality of what is at stake, and those stakes are too high right now. Too high for an office in this job. Thank you. Both candidates. I'd like to thank you for your attendance tonight, your participation. We really hope uh, tonight's forum has enlightened you to make a better choice uh, this coming election. We have a saying, and I'm going to close with it, and then Marilyn is going to give you the results of the questions out front. Democracy is not a spectator sport. Exercise your right. Go out and vote. Come Tuesday, November the 6th.